There are two different types of cells found in living things. Prokaryotic cells, which are found in bacteria and archaea, and eukaryotic cells, which are found in the eukaryotic branches of life, animals, plants, fungi, and protists. Today, we're going to focus on the things that we find in a prokaryotic cell. And while you'll find that prokaryotic cells are smaller than eukaryotic cells, I don't think it's fair to call them simple anymore. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about the prokaryotic cells. So if you recall, there are two different types of cells that make up living things, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are actually the most abundant type of cell on the planet, although you as a eukaryote probably spend most of your time thinking about those things that fall into the domain eukarya, plants, animals, fungi, and things like that, the bulk of living things are actually prokaryotic. There are three different domains in life, eukaryotes are just one. The other two branches of life are considered to be prokaryotic, the bacteria and the archaea. Now, prokaryotic cells are somewhat simpler compared to eukaryotic cells, but it's not fair to just say that they're simple. They still have lots going on, and that's what we're going to talk about today. What's interesting from an evolutionary standpoint is modern day prokaryotic cells are the cells that most closely resemble what we think the earliest cells on the planet Earth looked like. And in fact, most of the things that we find in prokaryotic cells are also going to be found when we talk about eukaryotic cells. But they're going to be different in some ways, and we'll talk about those differences a bit today. So let's start by talking about the basic things that we find in all prokaryotic cells. The first thing we're going to find in any cell is a plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is the selectively permeable membrane or barrier that separates the cytoplasm or the internal aqueous portion of the cell from the external environment. It's the basic building block of life. If you don't have a cell membrane, you don't have a cell and without cells, you don't have life at all. So remember that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable in that it only allows certain things to cross. And that has to do with the types of biological molecules that make up the plasma membrane. Now, if we're talking about the plasma membrane that's found in bacteria, as well as their eukaryotic cousins, that is a lipid bilayer that is gonna be comprised of phospholipids. So remember what our phospholipids look like. We talked about these in a previous video when we talked about biological macromolecules, in particular lipids. Phospholipids have fatty acid tails, which are nonpolar, and then a charged phosphate group, all attached to a central glycerol molecule. This particular structure gives phospholipids the behavior of being amphipathic. What that means is those greasy tails are hydrophobic. They do not like being around water. On the other hand, that charged phosphate group is hydrophilic. It does enjoy being around water. So what ends up happening when these phospholipids are produced in living systems, they form a lipid bilayer with the greasy tails facing inward and the hydrophobic or hydrophilic charged head groups facing inward outwards and looks something like this. This is what provides the selective permeability as most things can't make it through this sort of sandwich of hydrophobic fatty acid tails. Now there is a subtle difference between the plasma membranes of bacteria and their prokaryotic cousins, the archaea. The archaea don't have these fatty acid tails, for example. First off, they tend to have these branched hydrocarbons, or they can have these aromatic ring structures that make up their tails, as opposed to these sort of linear fatty acids that we see in bacteria. The other thing you may notice is that they, the, the glycerol group is actually a mirror image of the glycerol group found in bacteria. It's a subtle difference, but if you're a biochemist, it's something that's very interesting to you. These are what we call enantiomers. Okay, enantiomers are simply isomers. Isomers are things that have the same chemical formula, but a different chemical structure. In this case, they are mere images of each other. This is what's called an a stereoisomer or an enantiomer in biochemical contexts. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that the linkages are different. If you are looking at, a, uh, at, a, at the plasma membrane of a, an archaea, they actually have these ether linkages, whereas in bacteria and uh, eukaryotes, there's actually an, an ether linkage or an ester linkage there. The final thing that's different is the fact that in some species of, of archaea, there is actually a lipid monolayer. The tails are actually covalently bound together. So instead of having 
two like two lipids that are joined tail to tail, they're actually a single continuous molecule. So they have what's called a lipid monolayer. The big thing to understand is this, whether we're talking about a bacterial plasma membrane, a eukaryotic plasma membrane, or an archaeal plasma membrane, they have the same function. They are selectively permeable and function as a barrier to keep things from going into and out of the cell without being regulated. So that's extremely important for all living things. Now, inside of that plasma membrane, we are going to find an aqueous solution. This is called the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is a water-based solution that is just packed full of carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and all the other things that keep the cell alive. It's the solution that everything inside the cell is bathed in. The big thing to realize about the cytoplasm is it is aqueous, as it is in all living things, and that is going to dictate the way biological macromolecules behave inside of that particular cell. Okay, so just remember that aqueous solution. It's actually quite viscous. If you want to know what the consistency is like, it's very similar to if you cracked an egg open and kind of played with it uh, without it being cooked. That's kind of the consistency of what the cytoplasm inside the cells is. Now, if we go outside the plasma membrane, in most prokaryotic species, we're going to find a cell wall. In bacteria, that cell wall is going to be made almost exclusively of a polysaccharide known as as peptidoglycan. So if you recall from our conversation about carbohydrates, uh, peptidoglycan is a polysaccharide that consists of alternating N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid monomers. And then those long carbohydrate chains are joined together by small little fragments of protein. That's the peptido part of peptidoglycan. Um, this peptidoglycan cell wall is going to be found in almost every bacterial species. Um, one exception would be the mycoplasmas. Uh, mycoplasmas have lost their cell wall due to reductive evolution. Um, they have now evolved to be some of the smallest living organisms on the planet Earth, somewhere around 0.2 microns in size. Uh, at that size, they're slightly bigger than, than the average virus. Uh, but unlike viruses, they're considered to be alive because they still meet the seven properties of, of life. If we look at the cell walls in archaea, almost all archaea are also going to have a cell wall, but it's going to be different. You're not going to find peptidoglycan. In some species, you'll find a slightly related molecule known as the pseudopeptidoglycan. Um, but in most, you're going to find that their cell wall is actually made out of proteins instead of carbohydrates. Um, these, are, these form what are called an S layer on the outside of the cell. Uh, and essentially, these proteins are bound together in such a way that they form almost like an overlapping mosaic, almost like chain link armor uh, that you saw in the Knights in the Middle Ages. That's kind of cool. Regardless of, the, uh, regardless of what makes up the cell wall, the cell wall does, uh, provides rigid structural support for those cells. It doesn't contribute to that sort of selective permeability that the membrane does. Instead, it's there to sort of support the cell uh, and protect it um, from, from outside forces, essentially. Rigid structural support is the purpose of a cell wall. Now, what's interesting about the cell wall in bacteria or peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan is a carbohydrate that we as humans do not produce. Because we lack cell walls altogether and we do not produce the molecule peptidoglycan, Drugs like penicillin that specifically target the cell wall are incredibly effective because they destroy something that is essential for bacteria, but that is completely lacking in human beings. This makes them what we call selectively toxic. It hurts the bacteria, but doesn't hurt us. This is a very good thing. Penicillin and lots of other drugs specifically target the cell wall and destroy bacteria in that way. If we refer to the cell wall in the plasma membrane of a cell together, we're referring to the cell envelope. Uh, the cell envelope is slightly different. If you recall, uh, we have a video on gram staining. Uh, the cell envelope is what makes back gram positive bacteria distinctly different from gram negative bacteria. Uh, if you look at the cell envelope of gram positive bacteria, you are going to find a single phospholipid bilayer consisting uh, of, of phospholipids. And then beyond that, you're going to find a peptidoglycan cell wall. That peptidoglycan cell wall is actually going to be quite thick. It's going to be around 80 nanometers uh, thick uh, in these gram-positive bacteria, providing lots of rigid structural support. Compare that to what we see in gram-negative bacteria. You're going to find that inner phospholipid membrane. Then you're going to find a thin cell wall, about 1 to 5 nanometers thick, made of peptidoglycan. And then outside of that, you're going to find yet another cell membrane. So gram-negative bacteria have both an inner and an outer membrane that sandwich a very thin peptidoglycan cell wall. And these differences are what we detect when we do gram staining, which is, a again, a differential stain to help us discover the differences between certain species of bacteria. Now, there's one other type of cell wall that we should also talk about, and these belong to a group of bacteria known as the mycobacterium. 
Uh, mycobacterium have these uh, these chains of what we call mycolic acid that extend from the cell wall out into the extracellular space. Why is this particularly important? Well, mycolic acid is this weird sort of waxy substance uh, that repels water and it also does a good job of repelling things like antibiotics and also nutrients. Um, we talk about these in the context of human health and disease because there are two particular species that are of medical interest. One is mycobacterium tuberculosis and the other is mycobacterium lepri. This mycolic acid actually makes them incredibly resistant to being removed from your body, which is why tuberculosis and in the past leprosy uh, were such feared diseases because they were almost always fatal. Um, the other thing that this mycolic acid cell wall actually does is it actually makes them incredibly slow growing. So diseases like tuberculosis and leprosy often take a long time to actually kill their, their host because they grow so slowly. That same protection offered by that mycolic acid to prevent like things like antibiotics and, and phagocytes and, and other things to, from destroying them also prevents them to, from taking up nutrients, um, which makes them grow incredibly slow. In fact, it can take weeks to actually culture them in a laboratory if you're trying to study them. Now, that particular protection afforded by the mycolic acid is something that other bacteria get from what we call their glycocalyx. So a glycocalyx is sort of the prokaryotic equivalent to what we call an extracellular matrix in eukaryotes. It is a, it is a layer that is secreted outside of the cell, usually consists of carbohydrates or proteins or some combination of the two. And there are two major types of glycocalyx that we talk about, uh, particularly in the bacterial world, capsules and slime layers. So capsules are um, very tightly bound uh, and they're very protective in the species that have them. They can protect from things like antibiotics. They can protect from things like uh, phagocytosis, which are cells that go around and which are which is being eaten by our, our, our cells, things like macrophages and neutrophils and things like that. And we can actually detect these capsules and the bacteria when they're growing under laboratory conditions. If you ever look at a plate of bacteria and you see them grow, you see the way they grow on the plate, the colonies and so on and so forth, and they have sort of this shiny, sort of sticky, goopy appearance, that typically refers to some type of bacteria that has been encapsulated. They're producing this glycocalyx that affords them extra protection. Why are we concerned about this from a medical standpoint? Well, diseases that are caused by encapsulated bacteria are often harder for your body to get rid of, and they're often harder to treat with antibiotics. So when we look at things like, for example, streptococcus pneumoniae or haemophilus influenzae uh, and, and Klebsiella species, these are species that are encapsulated. And because they have this, this capsule around them, it makes it harder for your body to get rid of them and they cause things like pneumonia. It also makes it harder for us to treat with antibiotics because of their encapsulated nature. Now, other species have what's called a slime layer. Slime layers don't offer quite as much protection, but one of the things that we found from some bacteria that are pathogenic to humans that do produce this slime layer is that um, in addition to helping them sort of retain water and protect them, it also looks like the slime layer can also absorb your antibodies. So they can sort of defend themselves. They act as a shield sort of absorbing those antibodies that your body produces and protecting them uh, from being removed from the body by your immune system. So that's the glycocalyx. So we've talked about a lot about what's going on at the cell envelope and also outside of the cell. What's happening inside of the prokaryotic cell? Well, one of the things you're not going to see inside a prokaryotic cell, whether it's a bacterium or an archaean, you're not going to find membrane-bound organelles. So we're not going to find things like plasma, uh, like uh, endoplasmic reticulum or a Golgi apparatus. We're also not going to find a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus, but it doesn't mean they have nothing on the inside. Just like all living things, bacteria and archaea have to have genetic information. And just like all living things, that genetic information is stored in the form of double-stranded DNA. Now, the bacterial chromosome is different than what you'd expect to find in eukaryotes. Rather than being linear chromosomes, bacteria have what we call a circular chromosome. So picture that double-stranded DNA molecule wrapping around itself, but then eventually joining together so there's no end. Think of it almost like one of those friendship bracelets you may have gotten as a kid uh, with a couple pieces of yard tied around itself. Okay, so that's what the bacterial chromosome looks like. It's also not enclosed in a nucleus. Instead, it's kind of pinned to the, to the plasma membrane at a certain point called the origin. And it, it remains in place there. Uh, it also, the place where it's located is often referred to as the nucleoid. But again, it's not a structure. It's just sort of the location uh, in the cell where the main chromosome exists. Other types of genetic information you may find inside of a bacterial cell are called plasmids. So plasmids are not part of the main chromosome. They're these small 
circular pieces of DNA. They're often significant. They have contain significantly fewer nucleotides than the main bacterial chromosome does. But plasmids are very important, at least in terms of, of medical relevance. And the main reason why is this. Oftentimes, on these plasmids, we find what we call R factors. R factors are genes that encode antibiotic resistance factors. And these are of particular interest because as antibiotic resistance continues to evolve in many pathogenic species, we're finding that it's being passed from individual to individual or from species to species through a process known as horizontal gene transfer. Now, the main bacterial chromosome can only be passed from one bacterium to the next through what we call vertical gene transfer. This is essentially reproduction, okay? We do vertical gene transfer when we have children. That's how animals pass on their genes. But bacteria and archaea have a different option. They can also do it through horizontal gene transfer. And one of the ways this happens is by taking one plasmid, uh, taking a plasmid found in one bacterial cell and passing it to another prokaryotic cell. This is what we call horizontal gene transfer. We'll talk more about this at length in, a, in another video. Uh, but for now, just sort of hold that in the back of your mind that these plasmids are not part of the main chromosome, but the information that's found on them can often be very important, especially in terms of, especially having medical relevance in terms of antibiotic resistance. Now, that DNA in and of itself is great at storing genetic information, but remember from our conversation about nucleic acids, if you want to use that DNA, you need to first convert it into something called RNA, ribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid serves as an intermediary uh, to carry that message from the DNA and then convert it into the functional product, which is more often than not a protein. How does this happen? Well, this happens through the activity of another internal cell structure called the ribosome. So ribosomes in all living things have the same basic structure. You're going to have a small ribosomal subunit and a large ribosomal subunit. And those two subunits must come together kind of like a hamburger bun uh, in order to do the process of translation, which is the conversion of that messenger RNA into a protein. Now, ribosomes, if you remember, are uh, a riboprotein complex. They're roughly 50-50 protein and ribosomal RNA to make up that structure. Now, while superficially ribosomes in prokaryotes and eukaryotes are similar, at the molecular level, they're actually quite different. The ribosomes in prokaryotes are what we call a 70S ribosome, which makes them slightly smaller than the eukaryotic 80S ribosome. Um, the other thing to note is that archaeal, uh, the, the ribosomes found in archaea are significantly sim more similar to eukaryotic ribosomes than they are to their bacterial cousins. Nevertheless, the fact that there are differences at the molecular level between prokaryotic ribosomes and eukaryotic ribosomes is actually uh, pretty important, at least in terms of antibiotics. The main reason why is certain antibiotics target those regions of the bacterial ribosome that are different from the eukaryotic ribosome, which makes them, just like we saw with penicillin in the cell wall, selectively toxic because they specifically poison bacterial ribosomes, shut down their protein translation, and can be toxic specifically to the bacterial species, the pathogenic bacterial species, without harming us. Another thing we're gonna find in many prokaryotic species are what we call appendages. So appendages are the things that um, either help with locomotion or they help with what we call adhesion, allowing prokaryotic species to stick to surfaces. So in many species of bacteria, what we're gonna find are flagella. So flagella are these hair-like protrusions that move in sort of a propeller motion, or like a corkscrew motion, that allow the bacteria to move. These are found in many different species and, uh, of bacteria that allow them to get from point A to point B. This allows them to do what we call either chemotaxis or, or phototaxis. So chemotaxis is movement in response to chemical signals, like I need to get away from this, this is toxic to me, or hey, that's food, I'm gonna to swim towards that. Phototaxis is movement in response to light. We often find this in photosynthetic species. So they need to move to stay within the part of the water where light can get to them so they can continue to do photosynthesis. This is found in, in many different species, but one particular type of locomotory appendage we found in only one group of bacteria is what we call axial filaments. So axial filaments are, are, are made up of what are called endoflagella. They're almost like bacterial muscles where you've got all these flagella that sort of line the corkscrew shaped body of these spirochetes. Now, the thing is, is that this particular type of of motion is kind of eerie to watch. Uh, spirochetes get around with these endoflagella by basically wriggling from point A to point B. It's, it's kind of disturbing, it's kind of gross uh, the way they move, but it is incredibly effective for them. So flagella are found in lots of different groups of bacteria, whereas spirochetes exclusively, and all spirochetes have these endoflagella, also known as axial filaments.
Now, the other type of appendage um, are appendages that are involved in what we call adhesion, allowing microbes to, or allowing prokaryotes to either stick to surfaces or even stick to each other. The first one we talk about is what we call fimbriae. So fimbriae are these hair-like projections that aren't involved in motion. Instead, uh, they're sort of like those sticky hands that you, you could get at the grocery store uh, when you put the quarter in the machine and rotate it. You know, you kind of stick them out and they'll stick to the wall or stick to whatever. Uh, that is what fimbriae are like. They're these hair-like projections that allow species like E. coli, for example, to sort of latch onto your intestinal wall. They also allow E. coli to latch to each other. Uh, this is particularly important when we're going to form communities like biofilms. We'll talk about biofilms in another video. Um, that allows them to sort of stick to each other and to stick to surfaces. This is important, for example, if you're an E. coli cell, try not to get flushed out of somebody's gastrointestinal tract. Um, the other type of adhesive appendage we have are what we call pili. So pili are very important for a form of HGT called conjugation. They're these little tubes that can be produced by one cell that, uh, that extend to another cell and actually allow them to share uh, those plasmids from each other to do this horizontal gene transfer that we spoke about. The last thing we'll talk about in terms of prokaryotic cells are these structures called endospores. So endospores are found specifically in three types of bacteria. Bacillus, Clostridium, and Sporosarcina. These are all gram-positive rods. And endospores are kind of like a really cool way for bacteria to sort of live forever. Um, they've actually found endospores that are actually millions of years old that are still viable, as crazy as that seems. So endospores form in these particular groups of bacteria when they're faced with adverse conditions. And they can actually be quite medically relevant, which we'll talk about in a minute. What ends up happening is as those bacteria uh, sense that they're in a harsh environment. They can create some, they basically reproduce their, their, their genome and then enclose it in this, this structure uh, called an endospore that is highly resistant to heat and drying out and UV and, and all these other things that, we, that could damage it. And they essentially can live forever in this sort of stasis uh, until they return to, uh, return to good conditions, to proper conditions, and then they can go back to being what we call a vegetative cell. Now, the thing to realize is this. This is not a form of bacterial reproduction. They're not reproducing themselves. They're simply forming a structure to protect that cell until conditions return to support life, basically. Now, what's interesting is how these are relevant to us medically. Lots of diseases, including things like anthrax, uh, C. diff, botulism, and tetanus are the direct result of, of human beings taking up these endospores. Let's look at tetanus, for example. Clostridium tetani is a strict anaerobe. It doesn't want to be in an environment. And where do you get tetanus from? Well, you get tetanus usually when you get cut or punctured by things like, let's say, a rusty nail. Well, think about Clostridium tetani. Uh, it does not want to be in an aerobic environment, so it finds itself on this rusty nail in the middle of a field surrounded by oxygen. So what does it do? Well, it forms an endospore. Then all of a sudden, somebody punctures themselves with that nail. The endospore enters into the host, gets into an anaerobic environment deep within a tissue, and then all of a sudden, now you have the correct environment for it to go back to being a vegetative cell. It begins to reproduce. It produces the tetanus toxin, and the next thing you know, that person has tetanus. That's why if you ever get punctured by metal or you get cut, you go to the doctor, they say, when was the last time you had a tetanus shot? If it's been more than five to 10 years, they're gonna give you a new one to prevent that from happening. So endospores are the bacterial way of sort of living forever in, in, in only in some species, uh, but it can let them live for a very long time. It's also what separates us, separates things from being sterile from being disinfected. If you refer to something as being sterile, you have to have done something like autoclave that sample in such a way that will kill off all of the endospores. If you haven't done something that can kill endospores, if you haven't treated it in that way, the best you can label it as be, is as being disinfected. And this is very important because if you're not properly sterilizing your equipment or whatever you're using on your patients, you could be exposing them to potentially pathogenic endospores that may be found on those particular samples. So that's it for our conversation about the prokaryotic cells. Although they are significantly smaller than their eukaryotic cousins and found only in bacteria and archaea, uh, they are the most abundant cells on the planet Earth. Um, there are trillions and trillions more prokaryotic cells than there are eukaryotic cells. The other thing to note is while they are smaller, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're simple. They have a lot going on inside of them. And when we talk about their, their role in the environment as well as their role in human health and disease, uh, understanding how prokaryotic cells function and what they do and how they behave is extremely important. In the next video, we're going to start talking about the eukaryotic cell. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that one as well.
Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.